All right, let's continue with visualization analysis and design by talking about interactive views. So how is it that we can handle complexity in visualization? We've already talked about a previous strategy, which is to derive new data to show within a view. We've been understanding that for quite some time. Now we're gonna talk about two more strategies for doing this. And one is to have the view change over time to manipulate that view interactively. And the other is to facet across multiple views. So have more than one view at once. So let's talk about this. How do we manipulate a view interactively? So by this, I just mean, in some ways, the most straightforward thing is we somehow change what we see. As time goes by, we change. So what might that mean? One would be that any visual encoding choice is a thing we could change. We could change the visual encoding itself. We could change parameters. We could rearrange. We could reorder things within an existing approach to visual encoding. Even things we haven't talked about yet, like changing the level of aggregation and filtering, as we'll get into later. So any sort of interaction explicitly entails change. So this is powerful. It's flexible. It's probably the first thing you think of when you think about any kind of interaction is you change what you're seeing. Let's look at some examples of that. Uh, one is to change the visual encoding. Um, applications like Tableau are designed to make this possible to an end user, not just a visualization designer doing something explicit and bespoke, but a general tool that lets the end user change on the fly how the data is encoded. So here's several examples of a data set where um, the visual encoding is changed, even which data is being shown in the encoding is changed on the fly. Now, for a given visual encoding, we can also interactively change parameters. Um, and keep this in mind as, you know, there's various widgets and controls for this, like sliders and buttons and checkboxes and combo boxes, you know, all of the things that you might be used to seeing on websites. Um, what's nice about this kind of interaction is if you have widgets to interact with, it's usually obvious what will happen. That is the affordances, you know, what would happen if you interacted with that are visible. Um, often if you have your widgets labeled, then they can be self-documenting. So there can be a way where it is obvious what to do when you use these kinds of standard widgets. Of course, the downside is they use screen space. Um, and so that's a trade-off as we think about information density, um, how many pixels are available for the sort of visualization part of the view versus the controls. Now, another design choice is that it's possible to actually have these interleave together rather than a viz part and a control part you can have them perhaps much more interleaved. Here's an example of that, um, where we see um, we can do things like change the way the population is displayed. We can control the year with this slider. So these are all things that are not super surprising. We can either you know, order this bar chart by state or by county or by population as we saw at the beginning. So these are all controls that are integrated within the visualization uh, for the most part that allow us um, to change things. Now, another visualization idea is to rearrange the data, to change the order of that data. And so here's an example where we have a simple table and we can go back and forth between an alphabetical order and a data-driven order. And as we talked about back when we were just discussing tabular data, this helps us look at extreme values and trends. So here, for example, is um, let's wait for that to load. Uh, I'm showing a lot of these examples as uh, observable notebooks um, that are were originally written in D3. And so here, what you can see is we can switch between alphabetical order where we see, um, you know, it's easy to look up, but of course, hard to actually understand some trends. And it is much easier to understand trends when we sort the data in order. So this is something, of course, that you can control interactively in the visualization rather than building in um, as something that's fixed. So this idea of reordering um, is actually a very powerful idea. So here, for example, is a multi-attribute table. 
And uh, a nice idiom is this idea of picking a column, reordering the data according the data items according to that column, and seeing if there's any visible correlations. So here, for example, is um, let's take a look at that. Let's grab a random data set. Um, right now, we don't seem to see much correlation, but if we pick a different column, we can say, ah, OK, that one. Oh, look, column three and column five appear to be pretty highly correlated. Uh, what's happening with maybe some of the others? No, nope, not for column four or six. You know, And we can see it's very clear that we've got some categorical rather than quantitative variables here. Here we've got a Boolean. Um, here we can actually order things by date. So just allowing people to select columns is one very easy way to interact and understand the relationship between attributes. Another thing we can do is change alignment. So we already saw one example when we were talking about um, stacked uh, bar charts about how we could only actually compare the total length of the bar and the base bars. But for in the lineup system, they uh, have a nice uh, interaction capability, which is that you can move the alignment point. So here's a case where instead of aligning to the left, you're aligning to the middle. We get something that essentially looks like a diverging bar chart, where now we can actually do an exact length, uh, aligned length um, perception of those middle two bars, the blue and the green, as opposed to above, where we could only do the red and then the total length of the full bar. So that's an example of alignment change as a thing you could do interactively. Another interaction point is this idea of transitioning from one state to the other. So, and we actually already saw that in the demo I showed a minute ago, this idea that if you're changing a state from one state to the other, jump cuts can actually be very hard to follow what happened to individual data items. Um, so we'll be talking more about animation, but this particular case of a transition from one state to another is really the best case for animation. And uh, let's take a look at how that one looks like um, here, uh, which is to actually animate. So we watch these gradually move from the stacked to the group configuration. Notice how there's actually the staging to try to reduce the cognitive load as well. Uh, so first things split out and then move. And that's just a way to make this a bit easier to follow. Here's another example of an animated transition uh, where we can actually, as if we add more data into the view, as we can do interactively here, um, let's take a look at that collapsible tree. And here's another example of the use of um, animation to, let's open out a few of these again. Um, so notice how we've got this, it's quick. To, we're not taking, typically it's often these animated transitions are around one second, um, but they do allow something that's a bit easier than, ju than just a jump cut to understand how the items have moved. So we've talked a little bit about changing over time. Now let's talk about selection. So here's an example of what do we have to do in order to actually, the precondition for most manipulation is selecting some items to act upon. And this is a time which is worth thinking about, you know, what actual piece of hardware are we designing for? because they have different capabilities. So on desktop, if you assume people have a mouse and a keyboard, um, for one thing, you can assume a large screen, which we've been doing a lot of assumptions of in all of my discussions so far. But it also means that we can distinguish between hover and click, which is a thing that a mouse gives you. Um, in contrast, on a mobile, if you're interacting with a mobile phone, the kind of touch interaction you have doesn't actually let you hover. You can only tap. And of course, the screen is also small. Um, now, there have been various exotic things people have talked about, like just getting direct input from video. Um, and there's starting to be you know, sensors of actually getting the exact three-dimensional position of things like your hands. Um, although this has been quite popular in movies so far, we still don't have really 
ergonomically useful um, interfaces. You know, think about how tired your arms would get if you did this for eight hours compared to being able to rest um, on a table for using a mouse. Um, there is starting to be some ability to do eye tracking, but it's been quite difficult to use that to directly control the visualization because people's eyes do move around quite a bit in ways that they're typically not even consciously aware of. So there would be some trickiness there. So for sort of standard visualization, a lot of what we're thinking about is, you know, do you have click and hover uh, or just, you know, click, which on the phone would be a tap, is one thing you really want to think about. And so this brings us to selection, which is the sort of basic operation we have when we're interacting. So we have this design choice question of how many selection types do we need? Um, and think about the fact that with interaction, you actually involve human muscle motor control and not everything is equally fast. So for example, clicking or tapping is a fairly heavyweight operation compared to just ballistically moving the cursor around where you don't have to stop and acquire a target. For those of you with an HCI background, of course, Fitz Law describes how long that will take to acquire and it depends on how small the target is. The point being, these are different kinds of muscle movements um, and so you need to think about uh, what are the speeds at which people can do these. You know, do you assume you have, you know, the a keyboard and a mouse? You could have shift click, option click. Um, do you assume any sort of more exotic sensing, which is beyond just click versus hover? Uh, there's, you know, if you had true video tracking, you would be able to um, do something like see how far away somebody's hand is from a surface not just hover versus click. So there's a lot of possibilities for that. You also want to think about the semantics of the application. For example, if you pick something, if you select it, does that mean you replace what was selected before or might you want to add to it? Uh, or might you want to support both possibilities, in which case maybe you have things like, you know, a classic UI thing is, you know, shift click uh, to add versus click to toggle or change. Um, can a selection be null, right? Does it mean something to select nothing? Um, we're gonna see an example uh, in a minute where clicking on the background says zoom back out to where we were. Uh, that would be um, thinking about the semantics of a null selection. Um, do we need two things to select? In a lot of network visualization situations, there might be something where there's a source and a target if we have directed edges. So we might have some idea of not just a selection, but a primary and a secondary selection for say source and destination. Um, do we need to actually explicitly have membership in a group be something that you're supporting through interactive selections where you do really heavyweight operations like adding things to groups and naming them and deleting them from groups. So these are all things to think about when you think of the idea of selection. Now also I'm explicitly distinguishing selection from highlighting and highlighting is a visual indication that items have been selected. You change the visual encoding of the targets of selection. And so this is very closely tied to the idea of selecting, but the reason I'm really distinguishing between it is I want you to think about the visual encoding decisions about what it means to highlight. So for example, if you put the mouse over something and you click on it, does it change color? Does it show you in any way what that the system has noticed your click and is doing something about it? Notice how if you highlight by changing the item color, that's really visually salient often, but it will hide the existing color coding. And when might that be appropriate or inappropriate? You could add an outline, uh, a new mark explicitly indicating selection. You could change its size, right? Maybe you um, make a line wider. You could change the shape. For example, if you add a line and you selected it, it could turn into a dashed line instead of a solid line. There are many things you could do to change uh, this visual channels of the selected item. Um, do be aware that if you use motion, you wouldn't normally do that with a single view, but sometimes in multiple views, it might be worth doing that just so they can notice easily in the other view. Um, if you are attending to one view and then it, you want to see what happened in the other view, you might need a very strong visual clue like motion. So changing over time and selection uh, are two of the things. Let's specifically think about a particular kind of change over time that's so central, we're gonna really call it out and talk about it separately, and that is navigation. So 
how would we have the idea of the navigating within of you? And the way we can think about navigation is in some sense, it's a metaphor of a camera where we have a camera and we're changing the viewpoint of that camera, which means that what items are visible is changing as that camera, for example, might get closer or go up and down or sideways or rotate compared to what you're looking at. And so this idea of a camera metaphor sort of pervades how we typically would think about this. So whether we call it panning or translating, uh, or scrolling, um, that's about moving with respect to the thing that the virtual camera is looking at. Um, one idiom that's quite common in a sort of two-dimensional web context is what people call scrolly telling. That is, if you scroll down, that is navigating the page. That's sort of a direct analog to what you do if you're reading text in a web browser window. But you can repurpose this for use in an interactive visualization context. What's good about this, it's certainly familiar and intuitive. Um, the linearization of there's only one thing you can do, go up or down, is actually a constraint that can be useful, as opposed to if you could click anywhere at all in an interface, it can be hard to know what to do. So it's a much more constrained navigational path. Um, the downsides is sometimes if you're in a full screen mode, it might be hard to actually see, like how far are you if you don't actually see any kind of a scroll bar. Um, Sometimes what's so-called scroll jacking is where if um, you force the user to, to use scrolly telling in a way uh, that the designer essentially takes over the mouse, uh, that can sometimes be frustrating. That might not be the behavior users are expecting. And fundamentally, it's really a continuous control of scrolling down, but often these scrolly tellings happen in discrete steps. So sometimes there's a bit of a mismatch there. People have certainly uh, written about some of the issues involved. So panning is something that is particularly useful for two dimensions. Now, if you're doing anything like rotating or spinning, that's usually something that we do much more in a 3D context where you can either rotate an object itself or you can orbit a camera around an object. So these are much more common in 3D than in 2D. Uh, so particularly they're gonna be used a lot for uh, three dimensional spatial data types. Um, is when you would typically do a lot of rotation. Now, zooming uh, is something we do in both 2D and in 3D. So one way to think about zooming is that we are enlarging and shrinking the world as we move a camera closer and further uh, from that. Um, and geometric zoom is really mimicking the semantics of the real world, just like moving a physical object. Um, there's also other zoom types like semantic zoom, where you actually change the rendering uh, based on how many pixels are available, uh, which is um, um, not so much the semantics of what you could do in the real world and on, uh, say, physical paper, but something using the unique affordances of interactive visualization. One more to think, thing to think about with navigation is, are you constrained or unconstrained? Now, Unconstrained navigation is really easy to implement, right? You just, if from the point of view of computer graphics, you simply say, okay, they can move the virtual camera in any way they want. Um, often it's quite hard for the user to control it though. It can be easy to sort of overshoot or undershoot. You might need to do a lot of fiddling to see what you want. Um, having the designer uh, implement constrained navigation, often with the use of an animated transition from one viewpoint to another, um, is something that can actually give quite a lot of power. And so in this case, the trajectory would be automatically computed. The user would select something and the system would compute an automatic viewpoint change so that whatever you selected is framed nicely. Let's take a look at an example of that, uh, another D3 observable example. So let's say that I wanted to actually um, zoom into California well, okay, now I'm zooming, now I've got to pan over. Okay, now zoom a little bit more, almost there, zoom a bit more, wait, 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 went too far, here we go. Now, in contrast, if I just click on a state, then it will automatically compute some sort of a viewpoint. And now if I click on the background, then it zooms back out. So this kind of uh, zooming in and then zooming out is an example of a constrained navigation based on a selection. 
So we just looked at that example with the geographic map. So with this metaphor of navigation, we can also think about um, continuing with this idea of a metaphor of a physical camera. Um, we can think about not just reducing the number of items that we show as the camera, say, pulls back or zooms in, but we could think about reducing the number of dimensions we see, right? That dimensions are things we think about in physical space with a physical camera in two and three dimensions. Um, now that sort of maps to our discussion of attributes as we've been talking about, but we can think of reducing the attributes themselves. So in a medical imaging context, it's really common to acquire data, for example, specific two-dimensional slices. And then what we're doing with the 3D spatial data is reassembling those slices into the full 3D shape. And so sometimes it's useful to be able to think about taking slices explicitly within the interactive environment. Uh, sometimes this could be axis aligned uh, according to the original way that the data was first measured, or maybe allowing the user to arbitrarily indicate some sort of slicing plane to see that, um, which then brings up issues of interpolation of data. The other thing you could do that's very similar to that is this idea of a cutting plane, where you think of having a plane sort of like a slice, but everything on the far side is visible and everything in between the plane and the viewpoint is not drawn so that you get the equivalent of being able to see into uh, three-dimensional structures. Um, again, in order to try to see the complexity of the three-dimensional shapes um, where you can't just see everything from the outside because you've got volumetric data. This is particularly where it's common to do this. And then finally, you can actually change the way you generate these images, the projection that you're using to turn data into a two-dimensional image. So one of these would be what's called orthographic projection, where you simply throw away one dimension, like the third dimension into the screen. With perspective projections, you're going to actually mimic the um, geometry of physical space and how the eye works, where distant things seem smaller and close-up things seem bigger. We'll talk about some of the uh, complications of that when it comes to encoding information, uh, when we talk about rules of thumb. There's many other standard projections, anything involving geographic data. You have to think about how to project from the two-dimensional surface that's uh, a sphere into the flat plane. Um, and there's some other more exotic ones like Cabernet uh, projections for thinking about sort of blueprint style drawings. So there's many ways to actually project onto a two-dimensional image. These all come from the idea of having a metaphor of a camera as a thing that you can move with respect to the items that you are drawing in a viewport. So what are the benefits of interaction? Well, one of the good things about it is, you know, this is why we have computers. A huge advantage of computer-based visualization over paper-based visualization is the ability to interact with the visual representation and change that. So it's flexible, it's powerful, it's extremely intuitive. Uh, so there's a huge amount of use of interaction, for example, in the exploratory data analysis loop. You see things, you make changes, you see new things, you make changes. Um, it can also really support task switching. If you have different visual encodings that support different tasks, you could change between the encoding depending on what you are doing in that moment of an analysis session. And we talked about the idea that animated transitions can really provide much better support than simply jump cuts between two scenes to help people stay oriented. Is it perfect? No, nothing is perfect. Keep in mind that interaction has a cost and that cost is human time. So interacting takes time compared to say, just looking at a static picture. So sometimes that's a completely reasonable cost but keep in mind that sometimes interaction could sort of degenerate into human powered search if you have to go clicking through everything and systematically go through and try to see what's happening. So it's not always just a win. It can have a cost um, of time. Also, a thing to keep in mind, and we'll talk more about this in a segment coming up, is if you're changing the view over time, you have to remember what the view looked like before you changed it. That has cognitive load. And so we can think about some of the trade-offs of that need to remember what you saw before and make mental comparisons. 
Of course, interaction controls could actually take screen real estate, as we alluded to. And if you don't have it as an explicit widget, then it might be really hard to discover because if you're expecting them to just know that certain um, actions with the mouse or certain keystrokes might do something, that's pretty hard to communicate, especially to first time users. And finally, keep in mind that you might design for interaction, but it's up to the end user whether or not to interact. Uh, an interesting statistic from Gregor Eich is that the New York Times logs back in 2016 were showing that 90% of the readers of data journalism articles uh, from their newspaper did not interact beyond simple scrolling with scrolly telling. So interaction is a thing you can offer, but not a thing you can count on.